We are in Galatians chapter 5. You know, as we're looking through Galatians, it's, it's great to see the heart of Paul. It just reminds us of how we should have a heart like his. That you know, when people don't often accept what we have to hear when we share the word with them, that we would still desire to impart wisdom to them and to encourage them in the faith and to also pray for them because we know that it's a spiritual battle for our souls. And it, I think it's, it's great to see the heart of Paul where he, he tries to help people to reason through these false teachings that have come into the church, have crept in, and now people are trying to go back to something that God never intended for us to keep, the law. And it's not always the law. It could be other things that hold us in bondage, which we're going to talk about today. And so I want to just get right into verse 1 of chapter 5 here where Paul encourages the Galatians after giving them all these different scripture references and trying to use logic and trying to use reasoning. Uh, he encourages them here in verse 1, which is kind of a summary of what he wants to tell them, and that is to stand fast in the faith. Now, Paul, this is not the first time that he uses this phrase. As a matter of fact, he uses it many times. He urged the Philippians to stand fast in one spirit as they live a life worthy of the gospel. He also encouraged the Corinthians to watch and stand fast in the faith, to be brave and to be strong. And then here in Galatians, to stand fast in their spiritual freedom in Christ. Obviously, it is very important to know about our spiritual freedom in Christ. If not, it wouldn't have been mentioned here. In the original Greek, the term means, when you say stand fast, it means to hold one's ground. It means to maintain a position. It's like digging in your heels and not stopping. You know, not, well, in a way you are stopping, but not to move from that position, to stand firm, to persist, to persevere, and to not give up. These are the things that we need to hear today because you turn on the news, you listen to what's going on in the world, it could be very discouraging. It could seem like evil's winning. Goodness is, is not, and, but, but that's not true because God is on the throne and he is in control and he allows things to happen for a reason and he uses all things for good for those who love him according to his purpose. It's important because we know that we have to be steadfast, not just here in our freedom, not just as Paul said to the Philippians in the spirit or in the faith, but in all areas of our life to be steadfast, to be persevering, whether it's in prayer, whether it's getting into the word, whether it's in our own personal lives, our battle against the world, the draw of the world, the battle of the flesh, which we battle every day, and the enemy of our soul who's always trying to convince us to, to do things that are not good for us. And so we have to be steadfast in everything, whether we're going through trials, temptations, persecution, or inner struggles, no matter what we go through. We need to persevere through all of these things. And not only that, and the things that we should be persevering in, like in prayer, always being in constant prayer when we're doing anything. I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we've grown up to think, okay, prayer is only during the morning and at night when we go to bed, when it's something that we should do throughout the day. Even if we're at work, no matter what we're doing, it's amazing how you could be praying and not realizing how you're talking to God the whole time. And it's important for us because through prayer we get wisdom, encouragement, we are reminded of God's word, and we're reminded of things that we need to stay away from to help us, to guide us through our day. Paul says here that do not give up, basically, is what he's saying, in the fact that we have been freed by Christ, as Paul says, and avoid the temptation of trying to add or take away anything from the work of the cross. Because once we do, it becomes our work, and it is no longer something that was given to us by grace. If anyone exchanges the freedom given to us by Christ to any kind of legalistic relationship with God, it isn't because God wills it or because God tells us to do it. You see, these false teachers, they always come in thinking that they have your best interest at heart, that they love you and they're concerned about your walk with the Lord and you know they want to appeal to the spiritual side of you, the emotional side of you. And 
they want to appeal to the fact that, okay, you want to please God, well, this is how you please him. But on the contrary, they're actually pulling you away to the point where now your relationship with the Lord is reaching a point where it could be dangerous because he fulfilled all the requirements on our behalf. And that's hard for us as human beings to comprehend that because we always feel like we have to do something to get something, right? You want to raise at work, you got to work harder. You want a bonus, you got to do this. You want to have a great marriage, you got to do this, this, and that. And you know, you name it. We do this with all areas of our lives. What can I do to do something that I could receive in a better way? But instead, the Lord tells us to have faith in his word. That means to trust what he tells you when he says, I have done everything and I have fulfilled everything that you need. Now you just need to walk with me. Walk in the spirit. Follow me. Follow after me. Mimic me. Do what I do. Are you going to get it right? Not always. But that's where my grace comes in because I'm going to help you through all that. So trust in my word. Trust when I say that you are saved by grace, that you are saved by grace, that the work of the cross is sufficient. Because you know what's going to happen when we don't think that way? The enemy's going to have a field day with us, right? Oh, look at you. You're a sinner. Yes, you're right. I am. But I know also that God's grace is covering that. Does that mean that I should sin? No, absolutely. But I'm going to try my best not to so that I may please God. Because I love the Lord because he loved me. And because I love him, I want to reciprocate that love by doing what I can to live a life that pleases him. So I will take his strength and I will walk in that freedom but I will not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, which is what he says here in, verse, in the next verse. He goes, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What is the biggest yoke of bondage we must overcome in life? Sin, right? Sin. So, sin comes in many different forms. Legalism is one of those forms where at the heart of it is that we're trying to find ways to please the Lord, which he never really commanded us to do. He never asked us to do these things. And yet we feel like we have to or we need to in order to merit his favor, his grace, or, or that we're pleasing him by doing these things. How is this different than King Saul when God told them, go out and destroy the Amalekites completely, everything in the land, even their livestock, women and children. Now, even if he didn't agree with that, God had commanded him to do it. We don't always understand why God has us do what we do, but we trust that in his word it's right and we have to follow what he tells us to do to be obedient. And we know the story because when he goes there and he didn't do exactly what he didn't supposed to do, he didn't, ki he didn't kill King Agag and he, and he saved the best of the sheep and the herds and the livestock so he could offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel the prophet tells him, God said, I, re I require obedience over sacrifice. I didn't tell you to do that. It's no different than Cain when he said, oh, I got a better way to sacrifice, Lord. I'm going to use the vegetation instead of the meat. And the Lord's like, but it's not acceptable. But change your countenance. And instead he hardened his heart and he kills his brother because of zeal, zealousness and, and you know, jealousy. What is intent of the following of the law that we need to understand it, that it is to please the Lord through human works. And right there, that tells you the key problem. We can never please the Lord through human works. Now, when we're walking in the Holy Spirit, and we're being led by the Spirit, we will be pleasing to the Lord because the Holy Spirit will reveal to us the things that we should do or need to do. And, and it could be achieved because of what the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do. I don't have to sit home and think of every day like, Lord, what can I do today to merit your favor? Just go about your life and, and just keep that, you know, that, 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 mentality of just praying through the day and look for those opportunities where the Lord may be leading you to say, okay, here's what I want you to do. You're going there to buy some parts at Home Depot, but you're going to talk to that person right there who's looking at you right now. And you're going to be like, what? Seriously? He's like, yeah, go ahead. You know, and, and that's what we do. That's what, how God uses us. It's not very complicated. You know, it's just how the spirit leads. And 
And so, you know, anything that we do apart from God's word is really sin. It's disobedience. And sin is what brings us into bondage. This is just another form of it, legalism. And that's what Paul was trying to say to them. Look, this is not what God has asked you to do. So you're walking in disobedience. Many times we do things, but we don't realize that what we're doing is actually in direct disobedience to what the Lord wants us to do. Now, Jesus said to the people, if you remember in Matthew, that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why did he say that? Well, because he knew exactly what was going on with the Pharisees and the amount of pressure that they put on the people to be righteous. You know, they added over 600 laws on how to keep the Sabbath. That's on top of the other 613 commandments. How are people supposed to remember that? So now the Sabbath is coming wet. You're going to be like terrified. Oh my God, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to stay home and, and, and just do nothing because I don't want to break the law. How do you even remember that? I can't even remember my name sometimes. Well, actually, that's not true. It, it gets called out enough that I'll never forget it. But the point is that how can that happen? And, and Paul, we know, answered that. It is not possible to keep the law. It was never meant to be kept. It was kept to protect us, to guard us, to keep us from sinning, even though we were going to sin, but to sin less. But the most important thing that the law did was to remind us that we needed, we needed a Savior. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. And that's why he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to complete it. I did this for you and for you and for me so that you would not have that burden. And so this is what Jesus is saying because later on he rebukes the Pharisees because he says, you put a heavy burden on the people trying to do something that cannot be done. And so that's why he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I don't know if you know what a yoke is, but you know, it's used to put on, on sometimes animals and even people. To, and it distributes whatever load you're pulling on both shoulders. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful picture of how the Lord's yoke is, is really easy. And it's not heavy. It's not meant to be that way. Because we have this freedom in Christ that frees us from all the legalities of all the things that were required that are no longer required because Jesus fulfilled all that on the cross. So now that the Lord has relieved us of that burden, what does that mean for us? Well, now we have this opportunity to spend time with our Creator, to have a relationship with Him. Understand, if we're doing everything by the law, then our relationship is, be is based on what? Rules and regulations. But because we don't have the law, now we have this ability to just talk to our Heavenly Father. Call Him Abba, Daddy, like, we met, like you know, He mentioned before earlier in the letter. To have that time to really get to know the Lord instead of just focusing on what I need to do or I can't do. And then I love what he says there in that next verse, indeed I, Paul, because Paul is reminding them the Galatians, look, I was a student of the law. I was a Pharisee. I exceeded my contemporaries, and none of that matters to me. He says in, uh, I forgot if it's Acts, he says, I consider all these things as dung, that none of it matters. All the things I achieved in this world don't, matter at all because of what Christ now I have in Christ. And on that road to Damascus, in his zeal and his passion to persecute the church, God encounters him and, and opens his eyes, blinding him in order for him to see. Kind of like Samuel. No, I'm sorry, not Samuel, Samson. It wasn't until the end that he was blinded where he actually started to see. And sometimes we are like that. We walk in blindness until the Lord reveals to us the things that we need to see. And so he goes, indeed, I, Paul. Paul is a testimony to how the law does not work, how it cannot be kept. And Paul is reminding the Galatians, I've been in the bondage for years of the law, and look what it did for me, nothing. And Christ set me free. How awesome is that? More than you know of my testimony as a Pharisee, I exceeded all that I could. I was under the best teacher and none of it profited to me, nothing. And so this is why he says, indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now if the Galatians submit to going under the law, the law has no place in Christianity because Jesus fulfilled it and it, the righteousness of his fulfillment of the law is now imputed upon us. So we cannot, what was the point of the law? To achieve righteousness. We could never achieve it. But because of Christ now, we have, because it is imputed. In other words, it's given to us on our account. 
You did nothing to earn it. God just freely gives it to you. Righteousness. And if the Galatians continue to submit under the law, it's going to only impact their relationship with Christ. And because of Christ, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which works in us to mold us in the image of Christ. And therefore, making that yoke that was once a burden, no longer a burden, but one that is light. Because now we have this freedom to just enjoy what God is doing in us. But if you go back to the law, what does Paul say? That Christ will profit you nothing because, like Paul mentioned in the beginning, he said in chapter 3, verse 3, see, I got it in here. Are you so foolish? Foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? It makes no sense. You know that everything you got, you got by the Holy Spirit. When I shared the gospel with you, your heart slid up, your life changed. You were walking in the spirit, and now the things that the spirit was doing in you, you want to do it in your own human strength, in the flesh? Doesn't make sense, Galatians. But you know what? It applies to us too, because how many times do we do things in the spirit in the beginning when we're excited about Jesus Christ and you know we love spending time with him and and we try to do our best to to just you know honor God and then then you know life gets in the way and we start thinking well you know maybe it's okay to compromise a little bit here compromise a little bit there because it's for a good reason you know it really is this person's going to be blessed by this this person's going to be helped by that and the Lord's like no because you're stealing away from me getting the glory and you are taking the glory from me. Because Paul's using circumcision here, and I think in a way because he's going to mention that it's not about just circumcision, it's about the whole law. You can't just honor some aspects and then ignore the others. You have to fulfill all of it or nothing. And so he talks about circumcision because circumcision in a way is a seal, an outward seal of us living under the law. When God told Abraham, you will circumcise all the men in your, in, in your household. It was a seal of living under God's law in the future because we know that eventually when it comes to the Mosaic law, every male child has to be circumcised as a sign of their commitment to God. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's not an outward symbol, it's an inward indwelling of the Holy Spirit that reveals itself outwardly in the things that we do. Later on, Paul's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And how do we know we're walking in the Spirit? Because we're going to be able to see those fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? All these things that the Holy Spirit produces in us. And it's all one fruit. Not, but we'll get there when we get there. But... It's really cool when you think about how we as believers have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, which is now indwelling and it's made visible by the evidence that we're walking in it. But if you choose the law over Christ or anything else that you choose over Christ, remember that, especially like with the law, let's say as an example, how do you memorize those 613 commandments? How do you memorize that? As a, as a Jewish person, as a Hebrew growing up, to try to remember all 613 so that you can keep every one of them. Obviously, it's impossible. And God did not do this to, 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 to make something impossible possible. He did it to show that it is impossible to please God by our human flesh. And this is why he needed to do what he did. He became a man. He lived the perfect life that we never could. He fulfilled the law that we never could. And then he sacrificed. Today, as we take of communion, we're going to be reminded of that sacrifice that he gave his body and his blood for us so that we may be forgiven of our sins, that we may have remission. And so he, here he's saying, look, he reminds them, I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. But if you lose, but again, you know, if you choose the law over Christ, well, now you have to go back and learn how to keep all 613, which is impossible. But if you became circumcised, he says here that Christ will profit you nothing. Why does he say that? Because you cannot have Christ and the law. They don't mix together. He's given us grace, no more law. The minute you exchange the righteousness imputed by Christ 
by a work of the flesh, what are you really saying? That the work of the cross wasn't sufficient. You're saying to God that what you did wasn't good enough. What you did on that cross, that sacrifice that you lived, the fact that you left the heavens and came here and became a man and died for our sins is not sufficient. But I have a way that I think would work. But not only was the law yoke of bondage, but it was also had the reverse effect. Because instead of bringing you closer to God, it does the opposite, actually. You become estranged. Look at the next verse. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. That word estranged means no longer close or affectionate to someone. It fits well because what is a relationship based on grace? A relationship based on grace is a relationship that is centered in love because love covers a multitude of sin. Love is something that finds the ability to have compassion and grace and forgiveness. When we do things in a relationship that hurt one another, love can overcome all those obstacles in a relationship. You know, in any relationship, there are certain things that are understood. There are these unwritten rules that we all live by, whether you know it or not. For example, in a relationship, there are certain events and certain days and special ceremonies that we do, especially in a marriage, right? We have anniversaries and birthdays. Now, let's say one day you wake up, it's your wedding anniversary, and you forget to buy a card for your wife or your husband. Do you think that's going to go over well? Why? You forgot you forgot our anniversary? How could you forget our anniversary? That's like one of the most important things in our lives together, right? You forgot my birthday? I never forget your birthday, right? So, but, but you know what? It happens. It happens not because we want to, but we forget sometimes. We get so caught up in our lives. We're so busy. And we, and we think about it during the week. I'm going to go get that card. Okay, I, not today, I'll do it tomorrow. Then tomorrow you completely forget. Then now it's like two days left and you go, I'm probably talking from experience. And then you go, okay, now I'm getting it today. And then you come home and you go, it's closed. I can't go get it today. Well, maybe I could make my own card, you know? Like, <laughs> hey, honey, I want to do something original. I wanted to make a homemade card. Like, did you forget? Uh, what do you mean by forget? <laughs> So we don't forget birthdays. We don't forget anniversaries. We observe special days or occasions because they're special, right? But when someone has changed something outwardly, even in a marriage, right? And this applies in all relationships. You come home, you're wearing something different. You go get your nails done or your hair cut, and you don't notice those things. You're going to be like, did you notice anything today? Um, no dinner? <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> Um, no, I'm just kidding. And, like, and I can't believe you didn't realize what, what I did today. Or, or if I made something for my wife and, 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 you know, she comes in the house and, notice anything? No. I paint it. Look, it's a different color. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, how could you not see it? You know? This is how we get, right? But, again, there's grace. We have to remember that sometimes, you know, our focus isn't always where it needs to be. But my point is this, does that mean that I love someone any less because I forget the things that are important? Absolutely not, because you know what? There's gonna be times where for no special occasion, I may buy flowers. I may cook something special. I may just give a card. I may just give a compliment. You know, coming from working in the garden all full of dirt, honey, you're beautiful, or whatever, and vice versa for your husband. Because, you know what? Because that's love. In a relationship, if it was only based on the things that we notice or the things that we need to observe, then what do you think it is? It's a relationship that's based on what we do or what we don't do. It's works-based. And then there's no grace when we don't do that, when we don't do our part. And so, but love gives us grace. Okay, he's had a long week. I get it. He forgot. It's okay. You know, or uh, I can't do that today, I'm sorry, can we do it tomorrow? Yeah, but we planned on this, I know, but this came up. So we don't always do the things that we should do, but you know what, we do our best to do what we can. And God gives unmerited favor. 
meaning that we don't deserve it, yet by his mercy, his compassion towards us, he granted us something that we could never achieve on our own, eternal life and a freedom according to his word. And then Paul goes on to talk about how you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now that sounds pretty rough when you read that, you have fallen from grace. When I first read that verse, I thought about Satan. Oh, angel, you sweet cherubim, all this stuff, and you fell, how you have fallen. But here, it's not one of those verses that are meant to say that you can lose your salvation. At least, I don't believe it is. Because I think what it means is that from a relationship of do's and don'ts, that you are no longer living in a relationship based on grace. And so in a sense, you have fallen away from that grace because you have chosen to base your relationship with Christ strictly by the rules and regulations that you have decided would fit best or that's best for you or best for God when it's not. And so experience the grace of God which is motivated by love which should be at the center of every relationship. Love should be in every relationship. Without love, there is no relationship. Because in grace we find love, we find mercy, we find compassion, and we also find fulfillment. My experience for those in the body who I have known have leaned towards legalism. I noticed that with time, as time goes on, and they dig their heels into legalism, that they will display less love, less compassion, less forgiveness, more bitterness, and criticism of others because they're not spiritual enough. It's a dangerous place to go. And it's, that's like anything dangerous when we dabble in sin. A little sin here, a little sin there, a little compromise here, a little compromise there eventually could lead to complete compromise and complete just falling away. But again, Paul reminds you that if you seek to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. And this would certainly apply to those who reject the grace of God for a non-believer. If you reject the grace of God, well, then obviously you have fallen from grace and we know what happens. You're going to stand before the Lord in judgment. But for those who are saved, I also look at verses that talk about eternal security. For example, in John, the Lord proclaimed, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So both Jesus and the Father hold us in his hands. And sometimes the enemy will use our downfalls, our stumblings to, to tell us, you see, you're not saved. You're not going to go. You're, not, you're, not, you're, you're going to stand before God in judgment. But therefore the grace of God, right? And then even in Ephesians 4.30, it tells us that believers are sealed for the day of redemption. And then now we can get into the area of, well, maybe they were never saved. Maybe they, you know, they said it. They said the prayer. But, but you know, some people have fruit in their life, and then they fall away from God. And, and I got to tell you, for me, I stopped trying to think about all those things. I got to worry about my salvation in a sense of my relationship with God. Like, Lord, what am I doing in my life that honors you? Check my heart because my heart can deceive me. And so I have to think about those things. And at the same time, I think that salvation and who's saved and not saved is only God's wisdom and his knowledge because he knows the heart. We don't even know the heart, the Bible tells us. And so he does. And so I'm like, Lord, you know, if there's a brother or sister that we need to talk to, we have to do that because we love them and we care for them and we do care for their soul. But again, I'm not going to judge who's saved or not saved. I can also look at Christians and say, you're not living a Christian life because you're not walking and portraying the fruits of the Spirit that it talks about in the Scriptures. And we need to do that sometimes, confrontation, right? And we talked about that last week, how Paul had to confront the Galatians. And it's not an easy thing because he says, you know, have I become your enemy now because I'm telling you the truth? We need to tell the truth. But when it comes to that, you know, we could also look at it from the parable of the sower, which, you know, okay, this is the one where the the seed fell on good soil and so it produces fruit. But again, we also hear stories about the prodigal son who returned to the father. I mean, there's evidence in the Bible for both sides. So in the end, we don't really know. We just pray for people that we think that may just need to get back to Christ and continue to, to ask the Lord to, to help them get through whatever they're going through. 
and, and how God could use us to be an encouragement in that area as well. So falling from grace is sort of like not utilizing the gifts that we have been given in Christ, who allowed us to have access to the Father and all that he has to offer us as believers. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, what does it say? Trust the Lord in, in all your ways and lean not on your own understanding, or trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths, right? Or your path. I am faced with a situation where I need wisdom. So what do I do? I can try to do it in my own wisdom, right? Say, okay, I'm assessing the situation. That would do this, that would do that. Okay, I'm going to do this. Is it unbiblical? Probably. Okay, is that good? Absolutely not. Because it's not going to be from the Lord if it contradicts his word. James tells us that if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So now I have this access that God has given me to wisdom. I have prayer. I have all these things that God is made possible now because of Jesus Christ. But I choose to use my own wisdom instead of looking to the Lord to give me wisdom. So now what have I done? I refuse to take what has been given to me, the tools, for lack of a better word, that God has given us as believers to equip us to walk the walk and to live the life. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to do this Raul's way, and that's not going to be good. It's going to be trouble. It's going to be problems. And it's dangerous. Now, there is the grace of God. We know that Romans, it talks about how where sin abounds, grace abounds. But Paul makes it clear. Does that mean you sin because you know that there's grace? Absolutely not. Because in a sense, that's a willing transgression. You're willingly sinning against the Lord, knowing that it's wrong, but yet you're going to say, okay, God, your grace is sufficient for this. Not good. So it's important because not that we would lose our salvation, but we can get ourselves in trouble, and it could affect the rest of our lives. I look at men and women in the Bible. I look at David, how he made a lot of bad mistakes, and it cost a sword in his family. And, and you know, I, I, I see him as a man who was troubled by the things when he saw how his children were acting with one another, rebelling against each other and killing each other. And, you know, and, and the Lord warned him, this is going to be a sword. Now, God could have taken away those consequences, but, you know, sometimes there's some consequences we have to live with. And even in there, we have the grace of God. So to turn to the law is exactly what it does. We forsake the grace of God and we depend on our own works, which if I did something in my own wisdom and now everything works out well, I'm going to pat myself on the back and I'm going to say, good job, Raul, you did good making that decision. That was a win for everybody. It was a hit. And, I, and then like people go, oh, thank God. Go, oh, yeah, 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 thank God, of course, yeah. No, but I'm thinking... I did this on my own. So I steal the glory from God and I don't allow him to show himself mighty in my life. And that's the danger with the law because now the cross wasn't sufficient. It wasn't by the grace of God. And so now I have to achieve righteousness by following these rules that are not able to be kept, which takes the glory away from him and puts it in our hands. And so you can see how important it is. Look what I've done, Lord, right? Look, I did this. Just like Cain, just like Saul, just like Abraham and Sarah, we talked about it last week, where, oh, yeah, you know, take my maidservant, and it caused all kinds of problems in the home. Why? Because God had made a promise, but they did not trust in the word of God. They just trusted in what was in front of them, what they could see with their eyes. And faith is trusting in the things that we cannot see. We don't see heaven. We haven't, you know, there's so many movies about people who have died and gone, this is just a short little thing. Uh, because it just bothers me, and I don't really watch them because every heaven is different and every hell is different. And I'm like, so does this place change with the ages? Because some people go to heaven, they see this, this, and this. Other people see something else. Some people see other different things. I'm like, I don't know. Is that really that they're going to heaven or bad pizza or something they ate? I don't know. But the point is that um, we just need to, to just trust in God's word we haven't seen heaven, we haven't seen hell, but we know exactly what happens to those who believe in him and those who don't believe in him. And the Bible tells us just enough information to remind us how wonderful heaven is and how horrible hell is. 
And so he goes on to say that for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Those walking in the Spirit know that being circumcised or uncircumcised means nothing. What matters in faith, working through love. What matters is faith, working through love. So neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Nothing that we do is going to really matter other than the things that we do in the Lord by faith. Everything that we do is eternal when, when the Lord asks us to do things. That's why he says, seek ye first. What? That's right. And the things of this world we know are not important because they're going to be either destroyed by the moths, eaten by the moths, or what's the other one? Rust. <laughs> but the things that we do for the Lord, go, they go forward in eternity. And, and then one day we're going to be rewarded for those things that God had asked us to do. And we're going to just cast those things right before his feet because we're going to say, Lord, I only did this because you gave me this opportunity. You gave me the ability to do these things. We're going to realize a lot of things. That's why I think like when, when, we, when we stand before light, I don't think we're going to stand up in heaven and go, yeah, Lord, I know, you know, I did a great job. You know, <laughs> he's going to say like, we're going to, we're going to be like Isaiah, woe is me or Ezekiel, or any of those that got an encounter with God, like, whoa, because we're standing in perfect perfection, and we're going to realize how imperfect we really are. And so we're just going to be like, Lord, like, look at Daniel, great man of God. Look at John the apostle, when they stood before, they fall as if dead, because the glory of God is amazing. It, it, it would kill us if we see it. And so we're going to just fall on our face, but you know what we're going to hear? Not I did a good job. No, it's going to be well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to be the one that's going to tell us what we did. And, and I think that's going to be one of the greatest words we ever hear on that day. Because we're going to be like, <laughs> all right, I made it. I <laughs> did it. But I didn't do it on my own. So, <clears throat> so he says here, like, look, none of these things really matter. The, the things that we do don't matter. Um, but what does matter is what? Faith working through love. That's the key. Faith working through love. You have faith? Good. You should have faith. That's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But it must be faith that works through love. It's not a faith based on works, trying to prove yourself or to do things because you feel like you need to do it in order to receive something or because God has blessed you with this amazing gift of eternal life and now I have to do something to, 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 to honor that and, and show him, like, Lord, I, I, I appreciate it, and this is what I want to do for you. And he's like, don't do nothing. Just follow me, walk with me, walk in the Spirit. I'll show you what to do. You just take it easy there. And if your faith doesn't work, is it really faith? I love what James says, you know, about I'll show you my faith through my works. And that doesn't mean the works of the human flesh. It means that as you're walking in the Lord, as you're delighting in your relationship with him, you are naturally going to be serving him and you will be producing the works that comes from faith, not from things that you need to do. We're not Boy Scouts. We don't have to go out every day and find someone to help cross the street or sell cookies to make money. And we are just delighting in the Lord. And as we delight in him, all these things will just happen because the Holy Spirit is going to use us and talk to us and show us things. And it doesn't work. If it doesn't work through love, then it isn't real faith because this is the God that we serve. He is pure love. But your love alone isn't enough. Your love must also have faith because an abiding trust in Jesus is what he did for us. I remember the story of the two thieves. They're crucified with Christ. I always wondered myself when I read that story, why would Jesus be crucified with two thieves? He should be just the center point of that crucifixion. There should be no one next to him. And then with time you realize, oh, there's a good reason for this. And I often share this when I do funerals. I say that the story of the two thieves is a great story. You have these two thieves. Both of them are guilty of being on the cross. They have done things that merit them being crucified. And these two thieves, 
they know who Jesus is. They've heard of him, obviously, because they tell him things like, well, if you're the Christ, why don't you take yourself and us off the cross? Not realizing that he had to be on the cross in order to save them from their sins. But they both start mocking him. And then one of the thieves starts to realize as he's listening to Jesus, most likely just by the seven words that he spoke, the first thing, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You can imagine those thieves, they must have had hatred for everyone that was there, mocking them and, you deserve this, and, you know, the Romans who, who, who put them on the cross, and Jesus says, forgive them, Father. I mean, that's, that's real love. That's amazing. And, and, and you know the story. One of the thieves eventually tells the other thief, you got to stop. Don't you realize who this is? This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And he turns to Jesus and he says, today remember me when you enter into the kingdom. And he goes, today you will be with me in paradise. Actually, he didn't say today remember me. He just said remember me. And then he said, today you will be with me in paradise. That is the grace of God. And, and it's a wonderful thing because this is what we get. We don't deserve it. Maybe we didn't steal. Maybe we didn't murder. Maybe we didn't do anything but we still sinned. And in God's eyes, sin is sin. And all sin must be accounted for. Remember, there's a sacrifice in Leviticus to the sins done in ignorance. That means that you may have sinned and not realized it, so there's a sacrifice for that because why? Even though you may not realize that you sinned, God still wants that sin to be accounted for. And so you have to offer a sacrifice for it. Because that's the God that we serve. He is too holy to to observe sin. So as we partake of communion, we're going to end there because we have communion today, but as we partake of communion, we're going to be reminded of what the Lord did for us. And I just want to encourage you to remember how important it is to live in grace, <laughs> but also to give grace to others as well because we want grace, but we don't always want to give it, right? And I heard a story about uh, Billy Graham, supposedly a true story, where one time he was driving through a town and he was speeding and a cop pulled him over and he said, Mr. Graham, you were speeding 10, 10 miles over the speed limit. And he goes, okay. And he gets his ticket and he goes before the judge. And so he stands before the judge and the judge recognizes who he is when he comes up. He goes, you're Billy Graham. He goes, yes, sir. He said, okay, all right. Well, you're guilty and I'm, I'm going to fine you. Um, I think it was $50 or whatever it was at the time. And then he reaches into his pocket and he pays the fine for him. And he goes, this is grace. No, because I didn't deserve that. I should have paid that price, but someone paid it for me. And he reminded people about the story of Jesus Christ and how that's exactly what he did for us. We didn't have the money to pay the fine. <laughs> but... Jesus provided what we needed in order to pay for it. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for these reminders. And, Lord, as we partake of communion now, we just, just pray, Lord, that we take the time out to allow these words, Lord. It's your words, Lord. It's not mine. It's just you working through us. And to, to just meditate on these things, Lord, where we're at, where we need to be. Lord, we all stumble. We all fall. We all don't always live up to what we should, but, but therefore your grace, Lord, and how we need to be reminded of it, how grace changes everything in our life. Because grace reminds us that we have a God who is willing to forgive us and help us to start again. And, and you're the God of mercies. Your mercies are new every day, Lord. And you're not just the God of one beginning, you're the God of multiple beginnings. But we thank you for that, Lord, because we want to not just continue to take that grace for, for granted, Lord. We want to try to live a life that is pleasing to you. And so, Lord, as we partake of communion, remind us of how this is what you did for us, that we may live that life as best as we could to please you. Lord, I know we're going to make mistakes. I know we're not always going to do the right thing. But again, there you are to remind us to, to just pick up and keep going Though a righteous man stumbles seven times, he gets back every time. 